Last time we talked about Ronald Reagan being voted President of the United States. And then we talked about this assassination attempt on Reagan in which he survived and he earned himself a lot of political capital with Congress and with the United States. So essentially Reagan is going to enter his first term as president with a lot of sway with the American public. And he's going to be able to push his general political and economic philosophy on the American people. And what we're going to see is that he's going to be an effective communicator who will basically push this agenda of pro-business, economics, and conservative morality uh, as a means of governing the United States. Reagan thinks, and this is nothing new to the Republican Party, that the future of America resides in helping businesses grow. And he also thinks that the government should be there not to help you know, social issues, help the common guy or anything like that, but it could step in for things that Reagan and, you know, people that think like him would view as immoral. So we're going to talk about this Reagan revolution. Historians call that this period the Reagan revolution because Reagan's going to have so much power. He's essentially going to drag the Republican Party along with him. And we'll actually see a lot of Democrats get rid of their government as the agency of change philosophy to an extent. And a lot of Democrats will vote for Reagan and vote with Reagan. All right. So today we're going to talk about Reagan's economic philosophy, what he wants to do to help the American economy. And we're going to talk about how it's going to be very different than what had come in recent decades. All right. Okay. So under FDR and then continuing on to an extent under Truman, even slight bit under Eisenhower and definitely under Johnson, a lot of Americans thought the solution to the problems of the United States was the national government. We'd saw Johnson in particular create all these new social programs, the Job Corps, uh, Peace Corps. We saw Johnson with his great society uh, trying to answer the problems of the United States with government intervention, more uh, money towards education, that type of thing. Well, to Ronald Reagan, he's going to look at what happened in the 1970s, people, you know, this increase in crime, and to him, he's going to blame the increased government role in people's lives as the factor for causing these various problems. And to Ronald Reagan, his philosophy is going to be government is not the solution to the United States' problem. It is the problem. And that's actually a quote from him. Government is not the solution to our problems. It is the problem. So Reagan is going to adopt this philosophy that he wants to reduce funding to certain programs, programs that he thinks hurt American business, uh, reduce regulation, and allow American business to grow and cut off programs that don't directly provide for American defense or support the economy. Now, we can't talk about all the cuts he's going to do. There are certain things he's not going to be able to do, for example, like Social Security. By this point, Social Security had been around for over 50 years. Reagan would probably do away with it if he had the choice, but it's not going away, especially if you know you have these older people that have become dependent on Social Security, they're voters, so he's not going to get rid of that. There are certain things that have been embedded over time, a lot of things from the New Deal that have existed until this time that you're just not going to get rid of. There's no feasible solution towards getting rid of. So what we're going to see Reagan do instead is start cutting the budget to certain programs. Uh, some of these programs are going to be things like NASA, okay? And I shouldn't put this all on Reagan because as we talked about last time, since landing on the moon, NASA had seen a significant drop in its budget. Uh, almost 5% of the budget of the United States had gone to NASA during the space race. That had decreased significantly under uh, subsequent presidents, Nixon and Ford and Carter. Reagan is going to continue this uh this cutting of the budget. He's going to cut the budget from 0.84% uh, of the U.S. Uh, uh, budget to down to 0.75 uh, after his first term in office. Not significant cuts. And again, the cuts had come before him. But the idea is, what do we need to prove anymore? You know, the way to beat the Soviets, obviously, as Reagan would argue, isn't to show off these impressive things like getting to the moon. 
It's going to be other ways, military might, that type of thing. So if it's not essential for defense, it's not helping business, start cutting it further. Uh, and this is going to be a problem. And again, I wouldn't put this all on Reagan because the budget cuts came before. Because if you start cutting the budget, you're going to have to start you know, cutting the corners occasionally. And we'll see NASA doing things with its new space shuttle program. And this in itself is a means to cut the budget, basically, instead of having to shoot rockets up. Uh, and replace the space capsules every time. You just have this reusable shuttle that will go up on a rocket, come back, land, and then you can launch it up again next time. Um, but we'll see uh, NASA scientists start using maybe materials they wouldn't use before, not do as much testing as they would before, simply because they're on a budget now. This is going to be somewhat of a problem for NASA because they're going to suffer a series of setbacks in the 1980s uh, space shuttle flights aren't going to take off on time. Uh, planned uh, uh, international space stations, or I shouldn't say international, it's initially intended to be a United States space station, uh, will be dismissed. Uh, and they'll push for this international space station to share the budget with other countries. Uh, and we're going to see probably the biggest setback for NASA is going to come on January 28th, uh, 1986. This is when one of the United States' uh, few space shuttles, the Challenger, is going to launch. There's a failure of an O-ring, and the Challenger is going to explode. Now, this is only, I believe, eight deaths. It's not something that's going to affect a lot of people directly, but this is, to a lot of people, emblematic of what's been happening to the United States. We had all these dreams of space flight. We had gotten to the moon. People are looking towards Mars. Now we got these budget cuts, and now look what's happened. You know, uh, even our budget cut programs like these space shuttles uh, are falling apart. So a lot of people are going to take this to heart. I mean, personally, one of the reasons I don't like teaching uh, these classes that are close to modern times is because I remember some of this stuff. But I, I remember this when I was a kid coming home and, you know, my mom's crying or whatever uh, about this Space Challenger disaster. So this kind of stuff is going to uh, hit the American public pretty hard. But this is what happens, again, when you cut programs. Again, not not all on Reagan because some of these cuts had happened before. But this is sort of uh, this emblematic of this new U.S. attitude in the 1980s to reduce the budget. One way that Reagan will definitely reduce the budget is going to be in terms of environmental protection. So we talked previously about Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and we talked about Nixon creating the Environmental Protection Agency. And the Environmental Protection A Agency, the EPA, would go around, make sure businesses aren't polluting, make sure, you know, uh, measure how much lead they're putting to the air, that type of thing, how much uh, chemicals are being put into the water. Reagan is going to view the EPA as being overly bureaucratic, and he's not going to think it's completely evil or anything, but he thinks that it's hurting American business too much. So what Reagan is going to do is he's going to put uh, push through a significant cuts in the EPA. And he's going to consistently take these policy stances that are going to reduce environmental protections uh, for the average Americans. Again, it's not because he hates the environment. He just thinks that it's hindering business growth and you know, the, uh, the benefits of the EPA don't outweigh the economic uh, problems that it creates. So this is going to end up creating problems in itself. Uh, I'm not going to give all the different examples in the way that this is going to cause problems. I'll just give uh, one major one. Uh, this is going to be this Centralia, Pennsylvania. So Centralia, Pennsylvania is a small city in uh, Pennsylvania. It's a coal mining city. And as a matter of fact, the town was built on a lot of old coal mines. Well, Centralia is going to face a problem around 1962. There's some debate about it when there's going to be a fire and the fire is going to spread to the mines below Centralia. OK, now I don't know the science behind this. I thought fire required oxygen. I simply don't know how this works, but the fire is going to light the coal in these mines under Centralia on fire and it's going to start burning in 1962, and it's going to continually to slow burn throughout the 1960s into the 1970s. 
Well, it starts turning into a problem at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s because potholes start forming on the streets of Centralia, Pennsylvania. Not only that, people start uh, getting um, uh, their heads start swooning. It's obvious that they're getting carbon monoxide uh, poisoning. And they're going to call on the EPA to come out and uh, do these tests to see what's going on. Well, at this point, the EPA, its budgets have been cut. It's uh, busy dealing with other things. They're not going to be able to immediately respond. Uh, eventually, um, the people of Centralia will try to get in contact with the Reagan administration, and there's going to be this push to uh, either put out the fire somehow. I don't know how you put out a fire in the mine. Scientists could figure that out. Either put out the fire in the mine or maybe buy out the homes and let the people move elsewhere. You know, uh, the government can enact eminent domain paper people for their homes and then uh, move them elsewhere. Well, the response from the Reagan administration is going to be, that's not our responsibility. Again, there is a constitutional argument for this. That they'll say the states are responsible. This is something uh, that, that the national government isn't responsible for, so go somewhere else. Well, the people of Centralia are going to call the media. This is going to become a big issue in the media. There's going to be a lot of protests. Eventually, Congress, uh, without Reagan's blessing, will push through an approval of something like $42 million to buy out the residents of Centralia to uh, move them out of the, this town. And they will move out. Centralia will essentially become abandoned at this point. But it takes this major fight with the Reagan administration to get this through. Again, this is an environmental issue, and this is something that Again, the Reagan administration doesn't really want to deal with. Now, there's this story, and I don't know if uh, Reagan is being treated unfairly here, but Jimmy Carter, during the gas crisis that we talked about before, had installed solar panels on the top of the White House. You know, we need to reduce our dependency on foreign oil. Uh, one of the ways the United States can do that is by, you know, you know, using clean energy, this type of thing. Well, Reagan, he gets renovations to the White House and completely removes the solar panels. Again, there may be some explanation for it, but a lot of people buy into the theory that he didn't see that as the future of the United States. The way uh, Reagan sees things is that the U.S. should continue to rely on fossil fuels, and he's going to push for cutbacks in, um, in this clean energy. Um, again, maybe this helps out U.S. Uh, businesses. Uh, it also would be an expense to, to push for these environmental um, uh, for this clean energy. So Reagan uh, definitely kind of wishy-washy on this environmentalism and again just on unnecessary to him national government programs as well. All right so this is one attitude of this Reaganomics. Reaganomics is going to be what we call all these um, economic platforms of Reagan. Another sort of uh, aspect of Reaganomics is going to be anti-unionism. All right, so unions have been obviously around for a long time, gained prominence in the late 1800s, and they'd had their successes and their failures uh, since the late 1800s. As we mentioned, um, you know, uh, during Teddy Roosevelt, they'd become somewhat successful. They'd lost some of their success in the 1920s, regained it during the Great Depression. During the 1950s, a lot of these guys became associated with communists, lost some of their success. And then in the 1970s, Unions are going to face further setbacks as some people blame the economic crisis of the 1970s on unions. So the reason that uh, companies are outsourcing is because unions are making too many demands. So by 1981, when Reagan gets into office, a lot of people are down on unions. Now, not the members of unions themselves, obviously, because they still see it as a way to get um, better benefits. But a lot of people are looking at them in this negative light, you know, you know, step towards communism. These guys are, uh, you know, asking too much. They're the reason that industry is leaving the United States. Well, Reagan is one of those. Basically, Reagan sees uh, uh, unions as hurting business, but he doesn't step in when private business has an issue with his union. That's not anything he's going to deal with, but he will step in. Uh, in his first year of the presidency in August 1981, when some government employees go on strike. So August 3rd, 1981, 
about 13,000 air traffic controllers uh, went on strike. Now, air traffic controllers are employees in the United States because they're part of the Federal Aviation Agency uh, or Administration, Federal Aviation Administration. This had been formed when commercial aviation in the 1950s was getting big. You don't want planes crashing into each other. So the federal government felt it necessary to set up these air traffic controllers to make sure uh, the air lanes were, were kept um, open. You know, you don't, again, you don't want one plane crashing into another or anything like that. So the federal government employed these air traffic controllers. Well, in August 1981, 13,000 of these guys are going to decide to walk off because they want a $10,000 a year pay increase. So $10,000 a year, I think the average each of these guys are making is 20, 30,000, something like that. They want that a significant increase in $10,000. Now they've got a lot of leverage because there's not a lot of air traffic controllers that don't work for the national government. I mean, it's a job that's pretty much exclusive to the the uh, national government. You don't have, you know, uh, private people doing this. It's so these guys have a lot of leverage. Well, they go on strike. Planes are essentially going to be shut down for two, three days. And Reagan is going to get word, what do we do about this? Well, what Reagan is going to determine is that these guys, since they're employees of the United States, and I'm uh, the executive branch, I'm going to demand that they go back to work or else they're fired. And not just they're fired, but they're going to be banned from working for uh, from the uh, uh, for the United States government in the future. So they can no longer work as air traffic controllers unless they get back to work in 48 hours. So uh, he says, you guys have to cross the line, uh, go back to work, or else you're getting fired. We need these planes uh, back up in the air. Well, the vast majority are going to call Reagan on his uh, on the strike, and they're going to continue to strike in spite of his threats. Reagan will fire him. He's going to say, you know, uh, I, I warned you, you uh, disregarded my warning, uh, and you're fired. Now, through some of these Reagan's actions, we'll see some negative consequences come from him. There really isn't a negative consequence, at least uh, not in the uh, immediate future for this one. People fear that, you know, you're going to have this uh, commercial traffic disrupted. Instead, you don't. Reagan just orders uh, the few air traffic controllers that are still employed by the United States to start this extensive training program. And they're going to quickly, uh, comparatively quickly, uh, return back to their jobs. And not only that, but the FAA is going to start this dramatic program to uh, me- mechanize. I-, I might not have the right word there to uh, uh automate uh, air traffic controlling to where you don't need nearly as many workers. So instead of having a uh, you know human do it, you can have a, a machine or a computer doing it. So this is actually going to work. And a lot of historians credit this with this, this collapse of unions in general. The public's going to overwhelmingly favor Reagan here and say, yes, these unions have gone too far. These guys are making too many demands. This is the private response or the the perfect response. And you're going to see state government employees or state governments, whenever they have employees that are going to go on strike, they're going to respond the same way. You'd return to your job or else um, you're going to get fired. Same thing with private businesses. If you uh, don't return to your job, then you're going to get uh, you're going to get fired. And you actually see this threat of firing be so effective that a lot of people will uh, will stop joining the union, and some unions are actually going to uh, just stop striking in general. As a matter of fact, in the 1980s, there's only 15% of the strikes that there are in the 1970s. So 15% of what there were in the 70s, uh, number of recorded strikes, that's a significant drop. And in some places, unions will actually encourage their union members to take pay cuts like uh i live near the general motors plant in arlington texas in 1982 and and later on in 1992 the union actually tells its members to give up some of its benefits so the plant doesn't leave uh the city you know we we could send this to mexico or something like that and they can do the work down there unless you give up some of your benefits 
So this is going to be a hard blow to unions. As a matter of fact, uh, one historian says there's no way to overestimate the effect that this, uh, the demoralizing effect this air traffic controller strike or the failure of it is going to have on unions. Uh, and we still see this today. Um, uh, the number of strikes by unions, you rarely see them anymore. And a lot of people say this is a long time coming, but this is cemented by this um, 1981 air traffic controller strike. All right. So Reagan is pushing this reduction in government industries, this anti-unionism. Something else he's going to push as president is this weird economics. And as a matter of fact, his vice president, George H.W. Uh, Bush, will call voodoo economics. He's going to call it trickle-down economics. Now, this is nothing new to the Republican Party. They've essentially been pushing this since the Gilded Age. But this idea that if you cut taxes to the ultra-wealthy and you make things on, easier on the ultra-wealthy, then the benefits are going to make their way down to the lower classes. Okay, So if you have less taxes on the ultra-wealthy, though they will then invest it. So a guy making ten million dollars, if you you know, maybe before you're taxing him for three million dollars, now let's only tax him for a million dollars. What he's gonna do with those two million dollars is open a new factory and then hire ten new workers. These ten new workers will then, you know, buy new stuff from the factory. The factory owner will then feed that money back to opening uh, new buildings, things like that. And you're gonna create more jobs. And eventually, even by cutting these taxes, you'll eventually make the money back because there's going to be more spending. People are going to get wealthier. And then you're going to uh, still see this increase in, in uh, taxes coming in in spite of the fact that you cut it on the ultra wealthy. So we've talked about this a little bit before. After uh, the attempted assassination of Hinckley, uh, Reagan had seen a 23% cut on the, the uh, upper uh, percentage of earners in taxes. He's going to continue to push this through his administration, eventually getting down to where the uh, upper earners only earn 28, uh, only pay 28 percent of their income uh, in taxes. So if you compare this to what was going on during World War II, where the upper percent of percentage of earners were paying 90 percent or this chart even says over 90 percent of their income to the national government. Uh, this is a pretty significant drop. So uh, down here, it gets all the way down to 28 uh, during Reagan's administration. Now, does this work? Okay, most people would argue uh, no. Well, actually, even before I get there, he's not. It's only going to be uh, on the ultra wealthy earners. It's also going to be this corporate tax rate. So the United States, when it instituted its income tax, it also could take out taxes from corporations. But Reagan says, let's cut that as well, uh, at least initially. He's kind of going back and forth with that. But let's cut this corporate tax rate. This will allow corporations to reinvest. So does this work? Well, a lot of people are going to argue no. And as we're going to see, there's going to be some of the wealthy. Instead of reinvesting it, they'll start doing funny stuff with the extra money. Um, but for Reagan, we'll see that at least for a time being, it seems like it's going to work. So just know that during his administration, he's going to start cutting uh, tax on the ultra-wealthy to promote investment. Another aspect of uh, Reagan's uh, Reaganomics is uh, something he's going to call deregulation. Again, nothing new. Uh, we saw this in the 1920s with uh, Warren, Warren G. Harding and, and Calvin Coolidge. But what he's going to say with deregulation is that Essentially, and this goes along with his government is the problem philosophy, uh, government organizations like the Federal Trade Commission, uh, the one that in regulates interstate trade, and the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission that regulates the stock market, these organizations have gotten too much power and they're going to end up hurting business. So FTCs being too hard on corporations that maybe uh, use the practices like the monopolistic practices, that type of stuff that led to uh, the creation of the FTC. And the SEC, again, cre created after the 1929 uh, stock market crash by FDR. Um, he's going to say this type of thing uh, is going to hurt corporations. So we don't 
less regulation, the better. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to see is a, a drop in the budget for the FTC and the SEC under Reagan. Now, this is going to cause some pretty significant problems. One thing that's going to become very prominent in the 1980s that was around before, and it was definitely around before the creation of the SEC, is insider trading. So the whole reason the SEC was created back in the Great Depression was because in the 1929 stock market crash, the wealthy had gotten out before average Joe Schmo and you lost confidence in the markets. So the SEC says, if you have information about stocks, you have to make it public before you buy or sell stocks or else you could go to jail, face a fine, that type of thing. Well, when the SEC gets deregulated, you're going to see a lot of these investors. This is a picture of Wall Street here. These guys are going to start sharing information with one another, and the, you're not going to be able to catch them because the government body that's supposed to regulate this stuff is uh, is, is not going to be as powerful as it once was. Uh, and again, without um, uh, this type of regulation, you'll actually see um, uh, this in, insider trading. The Probably the big way that these stock market guys are going to use insider trading is they'll start creating these dummy corporations uh, offshore and we'll talk a lot about this offshore banking but you learn about a stock you know that if you tell your best friend to buy or sell this stock the SEC might make that connection well why not create an international company in the British Virgin Islands or something like that and you contact that guy over there using a telephone or some sort of communication that's difficult to track and you say Hey, Steve, and Steve owns your dummy corporation. Let's call it Steve's Sailboats or something like that. And you call him and say, hey, Steve, I just heard that orange juice futures are going to be great. Buy a bunch of orange juice stocks. Now, the information is not going to be made public until tomorrow. So we have this information. You buy it. Well, Steve in the British uh, West Indies or British uh, Virgin Islands, wherever it is, he's going to uh, call up a broker and back on Wall Street, he's going to learn about the information. He's going to buy these stocks, or he's not going to learn about the information. He's going to buy the stocks. He gets it, and they're going to say, wow, this was just an investor in this uh, off offshore company. Um, uh, you know, They just got lucky. You can't trace back uh, the insider information. And the SEC, because it doesn't have the budget it used to, uh, is not going to be able to track it down. So you'll see a lot more insider trading in the 1980s you did, uh, than you did before. Now, this is obviously going to be good for people, the wealthy people, people that are connected. But Joe Schmo, average investor, is going to be hurt by this type of thing. Same thing is going to happen um, where you know the ultra-wealthy are going to do well with this uh, IRS deregulation. So part of Reagan's administration is going to be to um, be easier on people uh, with taxes. Uh, so the IRS is there to make sure that you internal revenue service to make sure people pay their taxes. Well, what you're going to see a lot of these ultra wealthy begin to do in the Reagan administration is use these offshore dummy companies to start um, uh, evading taxes. OK, so let's say you are somebody that runs a. Uh, let's say a, um, a carpet, you manufacture carpet and you make some pretty good carpet and you make 50% profits. And, you know, a lot of this profits goes directly to you. Some goes up back to the company and, you know, the taxes have been lowered significantly. You're only paying a 28% tax right now, but you don't want to pay that 28%. Well, a lot of wealthy people, what they'll do is they'll start cooking the books and taking their profit and let's say they, were, they made $10 million profit. They'll say, in actuality, it only made $5 million. They'll send this $5 million to this dummy corporation, Joe's Sailboat in the British uh, Virgin Islands. And then the sailboat company will claim to have made $5 million selling sailboats. In reality, didn't sell anything. Uh, but now they have that money there offshore. They're not getting taxed because a lot of the places are going to go are places where there's not this taxable. Um, uh, the country doesn't tax. And you are only going to get taxed now on your $5 million. That other $5 million doesn't get taxed. You save yourself, what is it, uh, you know, $400,000 or whatever. So um, 
that we're going to see a lot more people do that. And because of this, again, you're going to have this ultra wealthy uh, get get even wealthier because that 28% tax rate they're paying is now lower. All right. So what we're going to see is this going to create this big divide between the wealthy and the poor. And this gap is going to start to widen in the 1980s to where, again, if you have money, you can continue to make money. And we're going to see this almost become a positive thing. This idea that if you work and sneak and sort of cheat your way into wealth, that, that you know it's better than being sort of the schmuck that has to follow the tax laws, the person who uh, doesn't have to listen to what, what everybody else is doing. If you get wealthy enough, you can make your own rules. And this idea that... You know, you can get to this point is going to be exemplified in this movie, uh, this p- pictured here, uh, where uh, Michael Douglas plays a stockbroker, a guy named Gordon Gecko, and in this movie, he uses these various schemes to um, make himself uh, ultra wealthy, get around the government bureaucracy, evade taxes, manipulate the stock market to the point where he makes uh, a lot of money. And at one point in the the uh, movie, he's going to say. Greed is good. It's good to pursue this type of thing. Um, it's actually, you know, it's what us humans are made for. It's the way things should be. We shouldn't we shouldn't be relying on the government, this bureaucracy. We should go out for ourselves, and we should, we should make ourselves wealthier. Well, the guy that created this movie intended Gordon Gecko to be a villain, but because of this weird culture of greed in the 1980s, Gordon Gecko will actually be you know, liked by a lot of people. And a lot of people use this as sort of this motto that you take all whatever means you can to get wealthy. And if this means, you know, not paying taxes, breaking rules that others have to follow, that's not a bad thing. And so you'll see in the 1980s, a lot of people, particularly these young uh, baby boomer generation, buy into this greed is good philosophy. Now, kind of sounds bad and it's it's this individualistic approach to um uh, to society you know take care of myself forget about everybody else again uh, we talked about this the last lecture if you're the parents of the greatest generation you know they have beating nazis in imperial japan they have surviving the great depression they have um you know uh, passing civil rights legislation you're not going to beat that. So you kind of turn in this, this weird direction. So we'll see a lot of people, you know, society, or at least, um, you know, this uh, middle generation, this baby boomer generation start to uh, honor these, these uh, um, greedy characters, I guess, Uh, people that don't obey the rules, people that um, take what they want. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of different characters rise up and uh, become popular. Uh, people like Leona Helmsley, who uh, did tax evasion, that type of thing, to become wealthy. Um, Donald Trump, this guy's going to become future president. He makes his name by uh, using real estate foreclosures, this type of thing, to um, make himself wealthy. And he'll sell himself as a brand in the image of Gordon Gecko. I you know, got where I am by taking things without having to pay these rules. And this is sort of the way things should be. You know, somebody should work for their success and we don't need this, you know, uh, bureaucratic uh, red tape in between us. If we do, we can cut it out of the way. So you see this weird, you know, at least for the time, you know, what happened previously, this sort of individualism take over. All right. So we have this, uh, going on. And what you're going to see is this will lead to, again, this ultra wealthy class taking these uh, these measures to sort of get rich quick and this type of thing. And it's going to go beyond these uh, insider trading. You'll see people uh, doing things like trying to accumulate all the silver on the market to um, uh, you know drive stock price or drive the price of silver up. If you... I, Get all the silver. The, the owner of the Kansas City Chiefs did this at one point. Um, if you take all the silver, you can continue to buy it up. That makes your silver valuable because you can control the market for silver. 
We'll see people selling junk bonds. In general, bonds are supposed to be uh, these long-term safe investments. Governments sell bonds. So the United States government would borrow $20 from somebody and say, I'll pay you back $25 in, in five years. And you know you're going to get that $25. You're not going to make a lot of money, but you're going to make some money and you're, you're going to get this back. We'll see a lot of private companies sell junk bonds where they say this is a safe investment. And then they take your money and then they'll just put it in wild investment schemes, real estate, that probably you're not going to get a return on your investment. And then if you don't return somebody's investment, who cares? The government's probably not going to prosecute you for it anyway because there's not as much uh, government regulation. All right, so uh, this time of these weird schemes is going to go on in the uh, 1980s. Again, um, you know, does this trickle-down economics work for Reagan? It doesn't because we're going to see this gap between the wealth and, poor, uh, and, and the lower classes and middle classes uh, dramatically increase. And what you'll see is that more and more Americans are going to have to live in multi-income uh, earner homes, okay? So whereas in the 1950s, 1960s, you would have a man work generally, and then sometimes the wife would go to work. What happens in the 1980s is that um, uh, you have more people, maybe their wages are going to go up a little bit, but the price of everything is going to go up alongside them. And we talked about this a little bit in the 70s. It's going to continue into the 1980s where uh, you need more money to buy the same things that, that uh, in the 1950s you could have gotten for the same amount of money. So whereas $10 in 1950 or 1960 could have gotten you five bananas, in 1980 it gets you one banana. So you need you need more money come in to pay for all the bananas you want, I guess. It's probably a horrible example. Um, but what will change is that these things are going to open up jobs at least temporarily. Um, in Reagan's first term, we'll see unemployment will increase substantially at first, but then it's going to start decreasing. And a lot of people are going to say this owes to Reaganomics, this supply side investment, you know, give money to the wealthy. They're going to reinvest, build new factories. Other people will claim that it's, you know, um, uh, price of gasoline going back down, that type of thing. But it is going to lead to a dramatic reduction in unemployment. Reagan's going to run on this in 1984, basically say, I got handed a, you know, a bag when I came in in, in 1980. Uh, and things kept going up. But, hey, look, we're bringing it back down, and this is because of my economic philosophy. And people will buy into it. In 1984, Reagan is going to run for re-election, and he's going to win fairly handedly. He runs against a guy named Walter Mondale. You don't even need to know about Walter Mondale because he loses just about every state. Um, it looks like he uh, wins Wisconsin and, and Washington, D.C. That's it. Reagan wins everyone everywhere else. So this shows how people buy into the Reaganomic system. Now, is Reagan responsible for this economic resurgence? Again, you know, that's that's up to you. But um, some people say that he's benefiting from this new consumer culture that is starting to take over the United States in uh, the 1980s. You're going to start seeing more businesses cater to the fact that you have these multi-income earners and more people cater to the fact that people are having to work longer hours um, uh, to make ends meet. Uh, what you're going to see in the 1980s is, is things like uh, fast food. Now, you had this before in the 1960s, 1970s, but more and more people, if mom has to go to work, she can't uh, you know, make dinner for everybody, why don't you stop by Taco Bell or McDonald's or something like that, grab your food before you go home. Uh, and then you get your food that way. This is going to open up a whole new set of businesses in the United States and a whole new type of uh, consumer culture. Not just that, but you'll see in the rise in the 1980s of malls. If you uh, need something, you don't want to have to go to 10 different stores. Your time's somewhat limited because you're spending a lot of time at work. You can't just send mom during the day to go to the various stores because now she's got to work. So you want everything in one central location. So you'll start to see more and more people go to these shopping malls where multiple stores are in one location. People are going to go to these malls, and it in itself is going to form its own uh, consumer culture. Again, malls will grow. 
and um, you know people will start hanging out there. Kids will start hanging out there, and this is going to become emblematic of, of the 1980s. Now it's going to be negative for a lot of the smaller shops that aren't in malls. You know, some of those guys are going to go out of business. But again, this is uh, for the companies that, that do get in malls, and especially the larger companies uh, that can afford the rent in these malls. They'll um, they'll benefit from it. Uh, this is the only type of new marketing that we're going to see uh, in the 1980s, or uh, you know, maybe not new, but becoming much bigger in the 1980s. Uh, telemarketing, uh, more and more people will start buying stuff over the phone. You're going to have things like home shopping networks pop up in the 1980s, where uh, people, um, you know, start. Uh, you you see something on the television, you just call in and use your credit card to buy it. And credit cards, you know, the, these things are going to uh, be issued to more and more people uh, during the 1980s, increasing this uh, debt spending uh, that you know that people may not have done before. All right, so maybe Reagan is benefiting from this change in consumerism in the 1980s. He could also be benefiting from changes in technology and these changes in technologies that are going to be born in the United States. So something happens that's not necessarily new. Since really World War II, um, you know, especially the 1950s, you had uh, companies like IBM using computers uh, to solve mathematical problems and solve problems that humans might not necessarily be able to solve or it would take them a lot of time to solve. IBM would create these computers that would do things like um, predict how long it would take a person to go to the moon and back. IBM worked with NASA in uh, creating the the Apollo missions. Um, but the thing with these computers is they were incredibly expensive because things like uh, the semiconductors, the microchips, the transistors, these technological science stuff um, was expensive. Basically what would happen is they didn't have enough data. You couldn't store enough data on these to be practical. You would have to buy a whole office room full of uh, these computer parts to solve the smallest problems. So unless you're the United States government or a major corporation, it's going to be impractical to get to a computer. It's just not going to solve enough problems uh, for it to be worthwhile. Well, what happens during the 1970s is some of this technology, microchips, transistors, semiconductor technology, starts getting more efficient, and you're going to get some of these private clubs of just nerds. That's what they call them, so nerds or geeks. Uh, start messing with this computer tech. So, um, you know, you would say, uh, all right, I can't afford one built by IBM, a machine built by IBM. I don't have a room to put this in. I don't have the thousands upon thousands of dollars to afford one of these machines, but I can buy these parts uh, much cheaper. And what you're going to start to see is the private just clubs of um, – uh, tech nerds that would create their own computers to solve random problems. So you'd have 20 people meet up in uh, wherever, California or something, and they would say, hey, guess what, guys? I built this computer that can solve this math problem. Hey, I built this one that can display this graphic. Hey, I built this one that can do this. Well, this in general during the 1970s was just a bunch of people that had a lot of time on their hands, and this was a hobby to them. It required a lot of work because these computers, again, they you got to be really a nerd who's very interested in this stuff to be able to operate it. It's not something that uh, average Joe Schmo could figure out. And part of this is because there's no interface. So you're putting together these parts. You have to have a lot of technical prob uh, technical knowledge to interact with the computer. So there's no operating system that average Joe Schmo would understand. And again, the hardware, you gotta you gotta put it together yourself. You gotta take all these cheap parts, put it together yourself, and then when you put it together, it's basically gonna be built to solve an individual problem. Well, you're gonna see a, a couple of these clubs in the United States, and and one will be in California. Some of these people are gonna think maybe we could make a computer that is understandable by Joe Schmo. So you think about this in the same way you think about Henry Ford. 
He had this combustion engine vehicle, but nobody would want it because, you know, it, it was uh, it was too expensive. And it was, uh, you know, his original quadricycle, you know, he could only be afforded by the wealthy. Well, some people in these clubs started to say, what if I could build one that was cheap and people could actually use it? Well, one of these clubs is going to be home to uh, this guy over here on the left. This guy's name's Steve Jobs, and he and his partner, Steve Wozniak, are going to decide, I think we could basically create the Model T version of a personal computer, something for everybody to use. Somebody could use it for typing. Somebody could use it for math problems. Somebody can solve these problems themselves. You don't need a big, expensive, multi-thousand dollar computer taking up the living room, you can have this small box that will do these things for you. So Wozniak and Steve Jobs are going to build this uh, computer that um, uh, they're going to call the the Apple. Um, the Apple II is going to be their big uh, first uh, computer. They're going to call their company Apple, by the way. Uh, and this thing is going to be able to perform these various operations Initially, even the Apple II, it's pr more practical than any of these private computers and, and some of the larger computers. But even then, the big problem with the Apple computer is it's still hard to interface with it. So you tell Joe Schmo, I've built this thing that's fairly cheap. It can solve math problems for you. It can allow you to type much more efficiently than a typewriter. But the average Joe Schmo is going to look at it. Well, how do I do that? How do I get it to do what you're doing? Well, you got to press, you know, escape this. You got to press control this. You got to press whatever this. So they built this great machine, but they couldn't find a way to interact with it other than, you know, nerds like them. Okay. Um, so this is going to lead to other people saying these guys have a great idea. They just don't have the software or the operational systems to operate it. And that's going to lead to this guy. So this is all starts to happen in the mid-1970s, but it's going to carry over to the 1980s. But this guy right here, his name is Bill Gates. Bill Gates and his friend Paul Allen are going to see what uh, Steve Jobs is doing and what other uh, of these smaller computer uh, companies are doing. And they're going to say, they've got great ideas with the hardware, but we've got better ideas with the software. Um, Bill Gates and, and uh, Paul Allen are going to create a company called Microsoft, and they're going to start pushing this DOS operating system. So DOS, if you've ever used it, it's nothing like we have, have today with Windows or anything like that, but it is a, you can type something in, there's certain commands, and there's a language that if you put in this code and you, you know, put the destination, what you want to accomplish, the computer will do it. It's clunky to us today, but in the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, it's going to be a major innovation. People are going to say, I can actually understand and accomplish these functions, unlike what uh, uh, Apple. Again, great hardware with Apple, but just doesn't have the functionality. So now you have a company with the hardware. You have a company over here with the software. Well, what Bill Gates will do is he's going to take his software to um, IBM, the company that's building the big computers, and he's going to say, I've got the operating system. If you can provide the hardware, uh, let's team up, and I think we can beat these Apple guys. IBM will start compute, uh, producing computers, uh, and their hardware is going to compete with Apple. Apple's going to come back, create uh, new hardware, new uh, uh, software to compete with uh, DOS. And you're going to see the beginning of these personal computer wars, basically where... Um, uh, these companies, IBM and Apple, start competing with one another uh, for this market, and more and more Americans will start buying these personal computers. Not just average Joe Schmo, but businesses. Businesses will start buying them, and they're going to be making operations much more efficient. And you can't really measure this, uh, but you can imagine the efficiency if instead of having to type something up and constantly replacing on a typewriter paper every time you, you make a a wrong mark you just have a word computer that has a word processor and you just have to go back and delete the things it's going to make things a lot more efficient again complex math keeping books uh stock that type of stuff it's going to be a lot more efficient on a, a personal computer 
So Apple starts with it, IBM and Microsoft get involved on the other side. You're going to see other companies like Texas Instrument, Dell, Hewlett Packard start getting into this PC industry. And the U.S. will come become the leader in this PC industry. Other com uh, countries will start uh, competing with the United States. But from then and really up until uh, modern times, the U.S. is going to be at the head of the PC industry. And a lot of it's going to owe to, to these guys right here. All right. So while these guys... Uh, um, are developing these things they're they're going to continue to uh, branch out uh, both of their companies um, uh, Bill Gates he's going to go on to create Windows most people these days are using Windows uh, as their operating system uh, and this is going to become even more efficient uh, Windows is actually going to benefit because Steve Jobs uh, continues to make new apples he makes this Mac Macintosh computer and he creates this mouse that allows you to uh, move your icons over the screen much more efficiently. Well, you know, uh, Microsoft and IBM see that. They're going to adopt the mouse, and this is going to make uh, Windows uh, successful. And uh, both these guys are going to continue on uh, and expand their companies. Microsoft, as we all know, uh, they're going to get grow so big eventually, uh, take over the operating system for so many computers that eventually Congress will, will have to look into them to, to determine if they're using this monopolistic practices. Um, Apple remains successful under Steve Jobs. He eventually gets tired of it after a while, and he, he goes on to form companies that use computers to create art. As we know, he's going to um, create Pixar uh, and, and you know start getting into computer animation and things like that. Later on, he'll return uh, to Apple and start running it again. So we have the birth of this computer industry in the United States, and this is going to explode, especially out in California, uh, near the area where Apple is, is created. You'll start to see this Silicon Valley culture where what can we do with this personal computer? What can come, else can come out of it? Well, one of the things that's going to come out of these personal computers is going to be video games. Now, the idea of video games, is, again, is nothing new. You can... Go back into the uh, 1800s, well, yeah, I guess 1800s and, well, early 1900s, and find these machines that would, you put some money in and they would solve some minor, you know, you move a little mechanical man around on there. Uh, but what video games will be is companies uh, will start creating this digital representation of characters on a screen and you can control the characters. Uh, this is going to have some success in the 1970s. So while Steve Jobs and um, Bill Gates are putting together their computers, other companies are putting together their own computers, but specifically to uh, create video games. Um, for example, uh, you're going to see your first arcade machine in 1971, and you're going to see your first major video game company come out in, in 1975, a company called Atari. Now, the video games they're going to come out with initially silly stuff like Pac-Man and, and, and uh, you know, we're just moving a couple uh, pixels across the screen. But people are going to eat, the, eat this up. This is something they've never seen before. You're controlling something on a screen. Sure, we're seeing these Apple computers, and these IBM computers that you can type things in. But, man, look at this. This pixel looks like a, an actual man or something like that. And Atari is going to become, this American company will become the vid biggest video game manufacturer uh, in uh, late 1970s. And then in the 1980s, it's one of America's biggest companies. Unfortunately, Atari kind of buys into the 1980s get-rich culture. And they're going to just pr start producing just garbage games. They're going to spend too much money on projects that, that don't pay off. And eventually, they're going to go bankrupt. But for a, a while, they're, they're this major company. I mean, they're still around today, but it's a much smaller company than they were then. Uh, for a while, we'll see Japan will take over the, this uh, arcade machine and then eventually these home uh, video game systems like you see right here, this Atari system. Um, uh, Japan will start replacing that with things like Nintendo. Uh, as we all know, Microsoft eventually gets into the uh, video game market with Xbox, but that doesn't come along until the 1980s. So we see this new industry within an industry. So we've got personal computers, American industry controlling it. We have these video games, and at least for a while, the United States will be dominant in this uh, video game uh, industry. All right, well, another thing that's going to come out in the 1980s is going to be advances in portable technology. 
Now, we're not going to talk about some of this because some of it is going to come out of Japan. As we've talked about Japan, post-World War II, industrializing, in particular some Japanese companies like Sony are going to de develop things like the Walkman, these boom boxes that you can carry music from one place to another so you don't have to be at home connected to your power. You can use this battery technology to listen to your music wherever you want. We won't get into that, but... The U.S. is going to, some U.S. companies are going to lead in uh, other types of portable technology, uh, particularly we'll see this cellular telephones start coming out in the 1980s. They call them cellular telephones because you're first going to have them in your cars. Eventually, uh, towards the end of the 1980s, you'll get these handsets you, you can make calls on. But what it is is you have these cell towers, and whenever you drive into a cell, basically the range controlled by a tower, you can make a call. It will ping off the tower. It will send that message to the tower, wherever the recipient is, and then they will receive the message. And this is very different than the landlines you had before. Now, in the 1980s, early 1990s, the cell, cellular telephones are in their infancy. They're not going to get to the point where average Joe Schmo can afford them. Um, but the U.S. is going to be uh, at the forefront of that cellular technology, and we'll see, uh, talk about later on how that's going to grow. Uh, one other uh, sort of uh, portable technology that the United States will uh, advance with, uh, sort of be at the forefront with, is uh, this GPS technology. And this is in the 1970s. Uh, the U.S. military is actually going to launch 24 satellites into uh, orbit, to better calculate missile strikes. So if we want to take distance, if we did it before, we would have to, you know, mark out on a map. You'd basically have to have uh, computer controls or you'd have to have a very unreliable system, you know, how much fuel it took. Well, by launching satellites into the air or into orbit, you can take one satellite, compare it to another, compare it to another, and essentially draw an X where you want a target to be. And then you can get a precise location based on the satellite uh, technology. Well, what we're going to see is the United States will start, commercial industries will start using these satellites to calculate uh, its own, uh, you know, for its own purposes. So the United States will be at the forefront of uh, GPS technology. Um, another technology is going to come out at this time that's going to affect people, uh, VCRs, but, but we'll wait to talk about those uh, more next time.